Welcome back. More now on the Harvey Weinstein case. Uh, now, the growing question certainly about whether or not Manhattan DA Cy Vance dropped the ball or not as it relates to this, and also the questions as to potentially why. Plus, new questions as to whether elected prosecutors, like Vance, for example, ought to take campaign money, particularly from criminal defense attorneys like those who represent Weinstein, who in fact gave to Vance's election coffers. Now, could that have impacted his decision? We won't know, but nonetheless, it's raising questions. For his part, Vance now says he will not accept any more campaign contributions while the Weinstein case is being investigated and he's asked a panel to examine. Now, for that, we turn to our legal panel. Jim Kasoris, criminal defense attorney in Manhattan, sits on the board of directors of the New York City Criminal Bar Association, frequently lecturing at New York Law School and the Bar Associations in Queens and New York City and many other locales. Doug Von Oist, founding partner of Carson Von Oist, focusing on corporate misconduct, selected by the Legal 500 as one of the most influential trial lawyers in the nation. You guys better catch up. Mayo Bartlett, an attorney at the law offices of I'm Mayo leaving. Bartlett PLLC, former chief of the Bias Crimes Unit at the Westchester County DA's office. And we're very pleased to welcome to the program Mimi Roca. She's the new distinguished fellow at the Criminal Justice of Criminal Justice at Pace University Law School, until recently, an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, a position she held for more than 15 years, starting when you were age 12. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so let's break this into two parts. Um, you heard um, what my last guest had to say, and you guys, to be fair, last week said, you know, I don't know, Vance had enough if he wanted to do something here. Was it a judgment call or did he really drop the ball? Your opinion. My opinion is when you have in front of you as the Jimmy DA. I've this much. Go ahead. Yeah. I, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by it. Look, I've been doing this for 31 years. I've defended people who've been prosecuted for less. Cy Vance is one of the most distinguished domestic violence bureaus in the city. Uh, they, they, they prosecute these cases. He clearly had enough for a misdemeanor. And what he had was sitting in his office, his former partner, and other very high-powered defense attorneys who had contributed to his campaign. Look, the very fact that they were sitting in his office, you know what it takes to be able to make a phone call and just go and see the DA yep. over a case? So it, it's all very troubling. The optics are terrible. And for those of us that are in the business for this long that defend cases on less evidence that are credible mm. cases, it's very troubling. Me, from your perspective, um, I've heard from folks who say, listen, they've gone after folks for far less than this. The, there was pushback from the NYPD to say, no, wait, wait, this was not the single piece of evidence we presented to the DA. There was more involved here. Um, it didn't fit the MO, at least of Cy Vance, that I've covered here. Were you surprised by the decision he made? And he also, in the camp that says there was enough here and more should have been pursued, given that this woman um, took the courageous step, one would argue, to come forward to law enforcement. Look, I think it's hard to, well, maybe it's easy actually to do Monday morning, you know, quarterbacking. Um, and I'm hesitant to do that because, you know, I, I don't think we know all of the facts that he had in front of him. I do agree that the recording sounds compelling as corroboration of um, what the allegations were. Um, but, you know, I know Cy Vance through other people professionally and know him to be a man of integrity, so I find it hard to believe that, you know, he was influenced by donations. I do actually want to take issue with something that Jim said, which is I don't think that the fact that he had the meeting with Weinstein's lawyers in and of itself is a problem. In fact, one criticism of Southern District attorneys is that they don't give enough access. Now, if he's only taking meetings with lawyers like Weinstein, that's a problem. But, you know, I know in the U.S. Attorney's Office, I uh, had the honor of serving, you know, many different um, U.S. attorneys. And part of the process that, that made people feel that they were getting justice was if they didn't agree with the decision or if they wanted to be heard, they could meet with the prosecutors and sometimes even up the chain as high as the U.S. Attorney, though that was yep. rare. But it's about equal access for that. And both Mayo, you and Doug, uh, you guys are former prosecutors yourselves. So there's the question of equity, which is if you were a non-celebrity, would your attorney have had that kind of access? 
And then also the fact, and I'm not trying to conflate the two stories, but in the case that um, with the Trump children, with that Soho um, uh, apartments that they were trying to move, et cetera, Kasowitz, who was the attorney for the Trumps, he not only got access in a meeting, but he also wrote a campaign contribution check. In this particular case, David Boyce. He also got access representing Weinstein. He also wrote a campaign contribution check. Now, maybe connecting the dots isn't fair, but on TV, you know, hey. But nonetheless, is that par for the course here? And also, from appearance-wise at least, it certainly comes across as tone deaf. Well, listen, these, these are lawyers are paid to get their client's position across the d district attorney's office. I don't want to spend any time on them. They did whatever they could do. I'm talking about now you're the DA. Not only you know the what, DA's office, Rich, the I, DA I, I think directly. The, the reality is when you look at this case, there's a different standard that was applied here to a actress and a, and a producer. We all know, every, nobody's really talking about it, but there's something called the casting couch, and everybody's heard about it. it was, there was a big part of the movie, The Godfather, that had a, a piece of that. And you had a position where an attorney could walk in and say, hey, listen, you're really going to do this to this guy with this, this, this actress who showed up in his room, and you're really going to do this? And there was a questionable call. This isn't about domestic violence. This is a, this, these are two different, this is a power uh, situation that's different than domestic violence. And that's the way this case was evaluated, and I think that's pretty clear. But Mayo, the standard applied and the access afforded, and on a more broader question, let's just do this. When you were at the Westchester DA's office, if somebody wanted to speak to the district attorney, whoever it was at the time, and they got access to have a meeting, and then they wrote a campaign contribution check, couldn't the general public who elects these positions say, time out a second here? You know, aren't the skills of justice getting potentially tilted a little bit? There's an appearance, at least, of impropriety, if not one. Absolutely, and I have the same issue when it comes to uh, campaigning uh, for judges. And judges say, okay, well, look, we're seeking contributions. I think it's unseemly for anyone who's appearing before those judges to give any money. So if, if the prosecutor's given money and defense attorney hasn't, are you going to get the same fair shake <laughs> and vice versa? Uh, but, but I think also it's important to look at the suggestion that this case didn't have enough information, enough uh, evidence for them to move forward. I would love to see them evaluate every case that way. I would love for them to sit down and look at each and every case and say, well, you know what, they claim that this person uh, committed a crime, but you know what, we've done our due diligence before we just run out and arrest. So when you're talking about Southern District cases, any federal cases, those cases aren't knee-jerk investigations. Right. They take their time, they do their best to make sure that you're the person. Most likely in state cases, it's, it's somebody says they got hurt. Well, if I start a fight with Jim, Jim wins. Jim gets arrested because he won. Nobody's looking beyond that. So you really do and need to do more due not diligence. access to the DA mm. to talk yeah. about it. I, 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 I have a problem with the access. Before I run out of time, uh, I had a couple of legislators um, on this week, totally unrelated subject. But I did say to them, while public financing for elections, be honest, it's not going to happen in my lifetime, I don't think. I think there's more of an appetite for the public to say, wait a minute, do we really want district attorneys or attorney generals to have to raise money to run here, let alone judges? I, I do think there's a distinction with a difference. I happen to believe in public financing, but for that, I don't want them to have to put the hand out. And by the way, I don't think at the end of the day that Cy Vance decided this one way or the other because of a campaign check. Right. But we're talking about it because that appearance is now in play. I, th I think it's high time we had that conversation. All right, coming up next, I, I want to give time for this next topic. In the midst of the opioid epidemic that we all call that, there was a new law passed that made fighting opioid abuse even more difficult than it already was. We'll explain, and our panel will take a look into just how damaging that that law was coming up next.